Welcome. In this video we'll cover Baba Yaga and the folklore theme regarding witches in Slavic mythology. I'll be reading some parts from the books mentioned in the sources below, so be sure to check them out. There was probably no typical appearance for the witch of Russian folk belief, though occasionally the image of Baba Yaga, an ancient bony blue nose hag, seemed to cross over from the magic tale into preconceptions of what a witch could look like. S. V. Maximo, for example, suggests that this was the usual image of the Northern Great Russian Witch, whereas the Southern Ukrainian witches tended to be beautiful young widows. Such a division between Northern and Southern witches is still neat, and it is significant that the memorates and fabulates to which Maximo later refers do not support it. Witches include young women, as well as older ones among the great Russian practitioners, and they often contain no mention of the witch's beauty or hideousness. Indeed, a survey of documents pertaining to witchcraft and of village traditions of real witches, as opposed to the descriptions of witches in the more fictionalized magic tale, indicates that witches may be of any age. In those accounts, where age is a factor, what seems to strike the popular imagination is not so much the resemblance of Baba Yaga as an unnatural longevity. The instance from the Kievan archives of the burning of the ancient woman suspected of unleashing a plague illustrates this point. Here, one must suppose the popular attitude reflected the feeling that this woman should have died much earlier. The peasants sought an explanation for her failure to do so in the supernatural and saw her in an embodiment of sterility and enmity to the earth and hence the cause of the plague. Peasants attributed the unusual and fantastic means of locomotion to witches. Sometimes they rode other people. Numerous narratives relate how witches jump on unsuspected victims who then become airborne and how, conversely, a clever person manages to bridle and ride the witch. When it comes to our Baba Yaga, she is an ambiguous and fascinating figure. She appears in traditional Russian folk tales as a monstrous and hungry cannibal, or as a canny inquisitor of the adolescent hero or heroine of the tale. Her archetypal instances resemble the devouring great mother that eats her children. Baba Yaga transcends definition because she is an amalgamation of deities mixed with a dose of sorcery. Though it is difficult to trace the historical evolution of this mysterious figure with exactitude, it is apparent that Baba Yaga was created by many voices and hands from the pre-Christian era in Russia up through the 18th century when she finally became fleshed out, so to speak, in the abundant Russian and other Slavic tales collected in the 19th century. These Russian and Slavic folk tales were the ones that formed an inedible and unfathomable image of what a Baba Yaga is. I say a Baba Yaga because in many tales there are three Baba Yagas, often sisters, and in some tales a Baba Yaga is killed only to rise again, and no Baba Yaga is exactly like another. As the saying goes, you can never tell which which is which. When it comes to etymology, Though only a few of the tales say it in so many words, most Russians would agree that Baba Yaga is a witch. The Russian word for witch is Vyedma. The word root Vyed means to know, and related words in modern Russian mean news. As in the title of Pravda's one-time competitor, the Soviet newspaper is Vestia, as well as information or consultation on the particle Ved means indeed as is commanding one's listener, know this. The word babushka is related to an ancient belief that when a person died, the soul left the body in the form of a bird or a butterfly. Compare the Greek psyche, which meant both soul and butterfly. If a butterfly fluttered by, it was the soul of a little grandmother, presumably in road to a better place. Thus, baba can mean old woman, though it does not always. The word starushka, more affectionately starushka, old woman, makes a woman's age clear. The second part of her name Yaga is harder to define. Scholars do not know exactly what it means, though they point to similar words as a comparison. One school of thought relates the word to verbs for riding, and it does sound rather like the Russian verb yehat, to ride. 
Another theory is that Yaga originally meant horrible, horrifying, and should be compared to the words Yeza, shiver, or Yazivo, chilling, horrifying, in some of the sought Slavic languages. Another more occulted possibility is that Baba Yaga is the devil's grandmother, who shows up in a Russian saying approximately equivalent to go to hell, idik čertovoj babuške, go to the devil's grandmother. There is no way to prove or trace this now, but it does suggest an interesting cosmogony. A Baba Yaga is inscrutable and so powerful that she does not owe allegiance to the devil or, or even to her storytellers. She is her own woman, a pathogenetic mother, and she decides on a case-by-case -case basis whether she will help or kill the people who come to her hut that rotates on chicken legs. She shows very few characteristics and tendencies of western riches who were demonized by the Christian church and who often tend to be beautiful and seductive, cruel and vicious. Baba Yaga sprawls herself out in her hut and has ghastly features, dropping breasts, a hideous long nose and sharp iron teeth. In particular, she thrives on Russian blood and is cannibalistic. Her major prey consists of children and young women but she will occasionally threaten to devour a man. She kidnaps in a form of a whirlwind or other guises. She murders at will, though we never learn how she does it, she has conceived daughters who generally do her bidding. She lives in the forest, which is her domain. In the majority of tales where she appears, Baba Yaga lives in an unusual house. It usually stands on chicken legs, or sometimes on just one chicken leg. Some scholars suggest that this underlines her connections with birds, though the eagle or the geese and swans that serve her in other stories are much more impressive than a chicken that most domestic of fowl. Animals venerate her and she protects the forest as a mother earth figure. The only times she leaves it, she travels in a mortar wielding a pestle as a club or rudder and a broom to sweep away the tracks behind her. The traditional Russian stove is a large construction of brick and plaster, the size of a small room and certainly the dominant object in any room it occupies. Some stoves were built so that they heated and took up parts of more than one room. The stove would incorporate shelves, ovens and hobs, nooks or hooks for storing cookware. Such a stove would hold the fire's heat, gently diffusing it into the house. This made it a favorite place for sleeping, the upper shelves high above the fire and safety far away from vermin or cold drabs on the floor will stay warm through the night. The stove is also associated with the womb and not only in Russian, the English expression one in the oven also connects baking with the rising belly of a pregnant woman. Joanna Hubs writes that the stove is more over a repository of dead souls, the ancestors. Even more than an ordinary peasant stove, Baba Yaga is a conduit for death to rebirth. As it goes with the great mother archetype, she gives the questioning hero food that allows him or her to enter the world of the dead, and often she chases the hero back across the boundary as he returns to Rus as if to make sure that he will not remain prematurely in the realm of death. In tales where Baba Yaga steals an older child, the child, usually a boy, must rescue himself. The gleeful description of how he tricks Yaga into eating her own daughter or daughters might work magic to make sure it is her child who will die, rather than the child of the tale teller or listener. This gullible, stupid Baba Yaga is no longer so frightening and making her devour her own child or children throws the fear and risk of death back onto her. We are more clever, we can use the magic of our tales to outwit the witch and survive into adulthood, where death is what we expect rather than a premature tragedy that impacts the community's future. Telling a child a story about Baba Yaga may scare the child pleasantly, like any frightening story or as a way of compelling better behavior, while at the same time it has prophylactic effect. After all, the very child who listens could soon be threatened with death. The story offers a mother or child as a measure of power over Baba Yaga. In return, it prolongs Baba Yaga's life and vividness in folklore. 
At times, she can also be generous with her advice, but her counsel and help do not come cheaply, for a Baba Yaga is always testing the people who come to her hut by chance or by choice. A Baba Yaga may at times be killed, but there are others who take her place. Baba Yaga holds the secret to the water of life and may even be the Mother Earth herself. This is why Baba Yaga is very much alive today, and not only in Mother Russia, but also throughout the world. For example, in my country, Baba Yaga is the equivalent to Baba Roga, with which parents scare their children that she'll come if they don't behave. A Baba Yaga is the ultimate tester and judge, the desacralized, omnipotent goddess, who defends deep-rooted Russian pagan values and wisdom and demands that young women and men demonstrate that they deserve her help. But what Baba Yaga also defends is the 19th century tales collected. In this volume are qualified that the protagonist needs to adapt and survive in difficult situations such as perseverance, kindness, obedience, integrity and courage. Like the Indian goddess Kali, Baba Yaga is terrifying because of her relationship to death. She mediates the boundaries of death so that the living human beings may cross it and return, alive but in possession of new wisdom or reborn into a new status. There were numerous other signs by which Russian peasants identified practitioners of black magic, sorcerers and witches were nocturnal creatures and could be seen roaming the village after dark. Some reports tell of witches moving about like animals on all fours with loose, uncovered hair, wearing only a shift. Others relate that they fly through the air using a broom, mortar or poker as a vehicle or transformed into magpies. Peasants claim that witches left home through the chimney and flew off to meetings or more accurately orgies with other witches and demons. Stories about witches holding the sabbaths on Bold Mountain a hill near Kiev, or any of the innumerable other hills known under this name can be found virtually everywhere. The most significant identifying mark for the witch of popular belief was a tale. On this account, a great deal of speculation existed. Sometimes the tale was thought to be quite small, sometimes small at birth, but of considerable size by middle age. Sorcerers, evidently, were not always pictured with tales. At times, one finds the specification that only born sorcerers had tales. At times, that on conducting a pact with the devil, the initiate received a small tale that subsequently grew. Belief in the existence of tales in witches was so deeply rooted that we even have eyewitnesses reports. A middle-aged woman from Tula province gave an elaborate account of how in her youth she and two girlfriends had chased a supposed witch and discovered this tale. We saw in her hind area a smallish tail the size of an index figure, all covered with grey fur, just like a hare's. The tendency to become channelings by assuming various non-human forms was highly characteristic of witches. Most memorates and fabulates about them contain this motif. Among the frequent forms that the witch assumed were those of a cat, dog, pig, mare, magpie, toad, and of such inanimate objects as a ball of yarn and a sieve. A highly typical story from Sarato province recounts how a youth was attacked one night by a strange pig. Uttering a prayer, he managed to cut off an ear and a hoof. By morning, the severed parts had become a human's ear and a hand and the youth soon discovered that they belonged to his neighbor, Martena. Concerning the witch's transformations into a magpie, a number of curious traditions existed. According to one, there were no magpies in Moscow because Metropolitan Alexei, recognizing witches under the guise of this bird, forbade them to fly over the city. Popular belief held that Marinka, the accursed wife of Dmitri, the pretender, escaped from the place at the time of her husband's death by assuming the form of a magpie and flying out of the window. In some places, it was believed that if a pregnant woman went outside when a magpie was in the yard, the child would be spoiled in the womb. Most accounts suggest that sorcerers, too, had the power to change their form, most often into a wolf, though they seemed to avail themselves of this ability less often than witches. One account knows that sorcerers who died before the expiration of their pact with the devil continued their harmful work as channelings after death. Peasants believed that both sorcerers and witches could make themselves invisible. 
Besides external signs or hints, there existed a number of ways to force the practitioner of black magic to reveal himself. In Penza province, it was believed that by lighting the poem Sunday candle in a certain way one could force sorcerers and witches to appear upside down and that if one made a fire of aspen wood on Holy Thursday, sorcerers would immediately come to beg the ashes. Throughout Russia, there existed variants of the rite for recognizing sorcerers and witches in church on Easter in Penza province by holding an aspen stick in Novgorod, Ryazan and Tula provinces by holding the first egg of a young hen in one's hand in Saratov and Orel provinces by wearing all new clothing. Peasants from Orel province also claimed that on St. Peter's Day, June 29th, one could unmask a sorcerer by attaching wheels that had never before been used to a stick and rolling them about in the back of the yard. If there were a sorcerer in the area, the wheels would shatter. Then, by gathering the splinters and burning them at a crossroad, one could force the sorcerer to cry out. In addition, it was believed possible to make a sorcerer leave a gathering, cursing or howling by holding the blade of a knife toward his heart and to make a witch transform herself by making an obscene gesture from behind. Clearly, the 19th century peasant, like the 17th century and pagan ancestors, felt himself surrounded by persons possessing supernatural powers and capable of exerting an adverse effect on his daily life. And indeed, he regarded no place, not even the church and no faction, whether an elaborate wedding or a simple evening gathering as secure from the possible harm of an evil wishing practitioner. Sorcerers and witches were prone to turn up anywhere and the peasant was forced as best he could to devise ways of identifying them and protecting himself from their spoiling. So this is it for today's video. Thanks for rebuilding Olympus.